This is a surgical technique for trabeculectomy, starting with a pair of blunt westcots and a pair of ring Fechner forceps. The conjunctiva is incised here with a small vertical nick, uh, temporal to the uh, incision, and then a five millimeter peritomy is made. Uh, we're using a pair of blunt westcots to cut Tenon's insertion, which is about a millimeter back from the conch insertion. And Tenon's may be attached posteriorly. It's important to do this under direct visualization, not to leave Tenon's on the sclera. Tenon's often retracts back into the fornix uh, once it's released. And using a curved tire, we can use it to grab Tenon's. Don't pull too hard because Tenon's may be still attached posteriorly. But now that we have it uh, grasped and elevated, we can now use the Westcott's underneath and again use sharp and blunt dissection to release Tenon's. It's important not to place the Westcott scissors blindly in the subcon space until Tenon's has been identified and held. Some uh, microcotter is used for hemostasis. And again, Tenon's is identified and lifted. We now can use, again, the Westcott's in a blunt manner to release uh, Tenon's posteriorly. Important to be careful around the superectus muscle, however, as that can cause bleeding. Dissect more into the fornix as opposed to over the muscle. Here we are identifying nicely Tenon's here, separating it from conge as well. And we have nice posterior space that's been created here that allow the mitomycin sponges to be placed as well as posterior filtration. This is using the uh, Westcott scissors closed here, bluntly swiping left and right to open up that space, which is a potential space. Mitomycin is now being used, injected here rather than sponges, under Tenon's again, 0.4 milligrams per cc, about 0.2 cc's, keeping a posterior and away from the limbal area. This avoids a vascular near the limbus, and the mitomycin is placed where it needs to be, which is posteriorly here, approaching about two millimeters from the limbus, but no further anterior. This technique avoids sponges and provides a direct titrated dose to the delivery site. We prefer to avoid injecting mitomycin prior to dissection as this causes TNOS to hydrate and makes the dissection difficult to lift off the sclera. The sclera flap is made 3.5 millimeters wide by two millimeters in length. We mark here just at the posterior limbus, the end of the blue zone, and our flap will be three and a half by two millimeters. Here we're making a posterior incision just at the back edge of the flap here. This should be almost full thickness, about three quarters thickness here. The scleral flap itself ideally is at least half thickness to provide enough resistance to outflow and prevent hypotony. This is using a diamond tri-facet blade to make that dissection. Next we will use a crescent blade which can be metallic or diamond. Again, the scleral flap should be half thickness of sclera to provide enough resistance. This lamellar dissection is started with some wiggling motion to get into that dissection plane. Here we're using a tunneling technique. This can also be done using direct visualization by lifting the flap. However, we like a tunneling technique to create a nice smooth bed. The blade is swept left and right to the extent of the width of this flap to create the 3.5 millimeter flap. Now, once we get to the end of the blue zone, where the white meets the blue, the corneal scleral posterior limbus, the tip of the blade is tilted more anteriorly, meaning tip up, heel down. This adjusts for the change in the curvature of the globe as we enter into cornea. This is important to do this to prevent premature entry into the anterior chamber, but not to lift the blade itself. We now have entered into clear cornea, at least one millimeter anterior to the visual limbus. Here we're using the diamond trifacet again to connect the radial edges of this flap this creates again a two millimeter long flap here with a 3.5 millimeter width base. And look how nice that smooth dissection is. Next, prior to entry into the anterior chamber, we'll pre-place 10-0 nylon sutures. These patches should be at least 1.5 millimeters long to allow for easy bearing of the knot. We enter full thickness at the edge of the flap, at the corner of that flap, and again pass in a radial fashion here to create that corner suture. These two sutures are placed at either corner here, and this should provide enough resistance to close that flap partially. It is helpful to get some pupillary constriction. Here we're using acetylcholine in the anterior chamber. And now the eyes entered here, in this case using a zap knife or a keratome can be used. And it's important to enter at the anterior stent of the previously created crescent dissection, not to create a false passage. Uh, the incision is then advanced here left and right to open it up. And again, it's important to enter anterior in the cornea, clear corneal zone. A crozophon de long punch or decimase punch is used to create that ostomy here. This is again using to really create a more anterior ostomy here, taking more of the cornea than actually the sclera. And one can note that the radial incisions actually don't go all the way into clear cornea, and this creates a bit of resistance anteriorly to prevent anterior flow. 
So it's a specimen showing actually the trabecular meshwork nicely. And there's the ostomy shown here again, relatively anterior to the radial incisions. The interdectomy is often made, this should be a broad-based interdectomy by pulling the iris out of the ostomy and then moving to the right and cutting and then to the left and then cutting. This creates a more broader iridectomy here to prevent iris entrapment into the ostium. And there we see the iridectomy present through the ostium that has been made. At this point, we are ready to lock the sutures in place. Slip knots are typically used, two throws in the same direction. And by creating slip knots, this allows us to try to the tension after BSS is injected into the anterior chamber. One slip knot is placed again on the left side, and then this is again the slip knot placed on the right. And typically two sutures are really all that's needed if we create this flap with the right thickness and the right dimensions here. Note again how we see the radials are not placed all the way into clear cornea, and this prevents the need for additional sutures along the radial edge. BSS is injected into the anterior chamber and the IOP is elevated to over 20. Uh, we do see some brisk flow. We allow the pressure to drop in the eye to mid-teens. Here we're going to tighten the suture a little bit here because the flow is a bit too brisk. What we want basically is essentially some gentle oozing of aqueous around the flap here as the pressure is brought down to about the low teens level. The tenonylon suture is then locked in place with a single throw in the reverse direction here on both sides. And the knots are trimmed nice and short. We do like to bury these sutures here into sclera to prevent erosion through the conjunctiva. And these knots can either be rotated into the flap or rotated posteriorly here but it is helpful to ensure that they are rotated so they're not on the surface of the uh, sclera. You can see actually some aqueous flowing oozing around the flap, and the chamber is still well maintained. It's important to identify this to ensure that the AC will stay formed postoperatively and prevent shallow chambers and hypotony. Sometimes additional sutures are required. Now we're going to close, and the closing technique is important to incorporate tenons as well as conjunctiva. We don't like to leave tenons behind. It tends to leaves a tenon stump, and anteriorly, the conjunctiva can be quite thin, leading to a central avascular bleb. Bearing the suture here, using nanovicular suture here, placing the needle through the conjunctiva, and then tenons here, here allows tenons to be brought forward along with conjunctiva to the limbus. This suture technique does allow the vicular suture to be buried. It is nice to use this nanovicular suture. It's desorable, doesn't require sutures to be removed, and it provides a nice closure. Monofilament here reduces inflammation created by the resorption of the suture. Again, note here how tenons has been brought forward. This is an important step to ensure we have a nice posterior bleb under tenons diffusing posteriorly. Again, we do anchor this conjunctival tenons flap closure here to the episclera as saw by that first throw, bringing conj forward here. And we want this flap to be on tension here at the limbus. And this is done by pulling the conj and tenons to the left here to create tension at the limbus and this helps to facilitate a watertight closure. Note that the initial throw of the suture was made in the episclera at the limbus, and then through conjunctiva and tenons, bringing it forward, creating a nice closure at either end with these wing sutures. Sometimes the horizontal mattress suture is used as well at the limbus, but in this case, we have nice tight closure, uh, injecting BSS, elevating a nice diffuse bleb, and we see that there's no leakage at the limbus, and we have nice tight closure. This surgical technique was performed by our fellow under my supervision, and we see a nice bleb forming with a deep anterior chamber with good pressurization of the anterior segment.